audio is coming through. Awesome. Okay, great. Um, so welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today, Friday afternoon, uh, to our second Burgess Visiting Professor Lecture. Um, it's really my great pleasure to introduce Professor Carl Linden uh, for his talk today on protecting public health with the speed of UV light. Um, so uh, as one of our Burgess endowed visiting professors, uh, Carl's in residence with us in Moore Hall this quarter, um, for the whole quarter, and uh, is collaborating with students and faculty um, for the quarter. So he's around. Please come visit in Office 302 upstairs. Um, he's coming to us from CU Boulder, uh, where he is a professor of environmental engineering and a Mortensen professor in sustainable development, and recently uh, was appointed chair. So congratulations to Carl. <laughs> yeah. um, so a little bit about Carl. Carl's really widely recognized for his pioneering research on water and wastewater treatment, particularly in UV applications, um, especially in the context of developing and characterizing advanced applications of UV and the novel applications of UV, uh, as you'll hear about today. Um, he's also well known for his efforts in work in sustainable implementation of water and sanitation technologies. Um, Carl uh, is really, um, I think, a, a pivotal source of UV information in our community. And uh, his group and the research efforts of his group have paved the way for a lot of applications in UV practice. You'll see many of those today. So uh, we owe a lot in water and wastewater treatment. And um, you'll see also in uh, public spaces and surface disinfection uh, to their work. Um, for the efforts that um, Carl has pioneered uh, as an educator, mentor, and leader uh, at Boulder and at Duke and UNC Charlotte before that. And he's received a number of awards. Um, so uh, it's been recognized uh, recently as the Clark Prize winner of the National Water Research Institute, which is a really, really high honor for environmental engineers, for those who are environmental engineers. Um, he is a fellow of AAAS. Uh, also, uh, he's received the Pioneer Award and Disinfection Public Health and Water Environment Federation, and um, also uh, Walter J. Weber Award for Frontiers in Research from AWSP. Uh, so some pretty prestigious awards for this work uh, that this group has contributed. Um, also, uh, he's made a very significant con contribution to us as environmental engineers in our community through service, um, serving as president for AWSP, which is the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors, which is our home in environmental engineering. Um, in academia, and um, now increasingly in practice industry and research. Uh, and also uh, president by UVA International uh, of the Violet Association. Um, so a lot of connections to practice and application and implementation of UV light in these roles. Um, so uh, a few lighter factoids about Carl. Uh, so some things I learned just yesterday, some things I hadn't even thought about before, might be of interest. Um, he is a thespian and uh, has a background in theater way back. And apparently uh, was uh, working in a theater group as friend and understudy of Ben Stiller work as a, a young person. And um, also is a big fan of the Grateful Dead, uh, as many of us are. And, and spent quite a bit of time traveling. And I, I just learned a little bit earlier, 250 or 300 <laughs> concerts or so uh, with the dead. So if, um, uh, great opportunities to catch the, uh, the dead during their prime. Um, he also, this is really cool, actually, has published three papers with his daughter, Yaro. Uh, Yaro uh, was a student here in public health with Scott Meshke's group uh, for bachelors and is now doing her PhD over at UNC Chapel Hill, um, just next door to where Carl was at Duke. Um, so she's um, now following along uh, in similar similar footpath. And uh, also in general, uh, Carl's a big fan of hiking. Music, as you heard, uh, a lot of live concerts, uh, yoga, and lots of cooking and drinking great beer. Uh, so I've enjoyed spending a lot of good times with Carl in the past. I can vouch for those, a uh, number of those uh, aspects. So um, with that, hopefully you have a good picture of Carl Linden. Uh, and I'd like to welcome Carl. Uh, so with that, please welcome Carl. And before I turn the mic over to Carl, I also want to say thank you very, very much to Stephen Sabian and Burgess 
for making this all possible. I really just wanted to recognize Council Reed and Steve for endowing the professorship and giving us the opportunity to invite people like Carl and Timo to spend time with us here on campus. And um, also just for their unwavering generosity and dedication to the program. Uh, we're really fortunate to have you as part of our family. And uh, we thank you so much for that. So uh, we're rather applause for some of the Okay, so I should turn it over for now. Great. Took like 10 minutes, Mike. <clears throat> thank you, Mike. Thanks a lot, everybody, for coming. Um, thank you, Steve and Sylvia. I think um, I'm really kind of uh, interested in starting a program like this at the University of Colorado once I become chair, hoping to raise some funds around that. So I want to follow in those footsteps that you've provided and the model you have here, which I think is a really awesome opportunity to bring people to the university and really, really get in deep with, with faculty and students and Get to know people and develop new collaborations. So thanks a lot for doing that. Um, quick recognition: my partner Rebecca's here, and my cousin is here too, Daisy. So I've got two great supporters, as well as um, <coughs> other folks. I'll, I'll point out in a little bit. Um, so today I want to talk to you about really the journey I've been on on my research uh, throughout my career, looking at UV applications. And I'll kind of step you through that, and I've been really inspired by the seminar series that you all have here, which kind of talks about the academic journeys of the faculty and I've been really enjoying watching those and seeing how people got to where they are so you get a little bit of taste of that for me here as well and before I start I really want to recognize the folks that do everything that you kind of kind of put into place some of the visions I have and then contribute greatly to the visions of our research and that's all the students that make the work possible see if this is working here That works. Good. So I got a few pictures of folks, um, some of my students over the years that really made all this work possible and contributed all the amazing ideas that we've had and the, the progress that we've made in my group. <clears throat> some pictures from Boulder as well. And I have um, the pleasure of inviting one of my students from Boulder to visit us here for about a month. This is Mike, Emma is in the back there. Thanks, Emma, for coming along. I think one of the best ways to develop a collaboration uh, is to bring students together and have them work together. And that's really exciting that the Burgess uh, Fellowship helps to enable that by providing funding for her to come as well and enable you know, a good visit to happen. And that actually reminds me when I first met Mike, um, he was a grad student in Switzerland and I was maybe there on sabbatical. I'm not sure if that was the time, but one of my students came with me as well to Switzerland at that point, got a good collaboration going. So it's really nice to do that. So thanks to all these folks here. So let's go through um, a couple of points about my journey. <clears throat> I call it the right place, the right time with the right people, because it's all about almost serendipity about how we get to where we are. And I think I've heard this a lot in the talks I've seen through the faculty here at the University of Washington <clears throat> in the department. But back in 1987, I was an undergrad at Cornell. And, and this, this uh, fa faculty member, Bill Jewell, really enabled me to get involved in research. I had an NSF undergrad research fellowship with him. And he was one of the pioneers looking at kind of development of alternative gases from waste products. So looking at methane generation, he was kind of ahead of his time and he always rubbed edges and elbows with people. And I kind of learned a bit of a fighting spirit from him about you know, really standing up for what you believe in as far as your research and moving forward you know, in light of some naysayers even. And I'll tell you about that too. Um, I got the chance to work on a project with Bill, and that project eventually moved to University of California at Davis, where I decided to go to grad school. And so my first claim to fame was being on the cover of BioCycle magazine. That's me back in 1991, uh, working on an anaerobic digestion project where we tried to produce methane from solid waste. I was, I was the person who sorted through the garbage and put all the organic stuff in the, in the digester and threw out all the plastic. It's a little bit before we had a lot of recycling. And George Sabanagos was the professor at Davis who brought me there and brought the project. And the project eventually moved to the Folsom State Prison, where the prisoners did the work that I did. Um, but it still is working on a great, great, great program. In 1992, I was able to get a position uh, working with Professor Jeannie Darby, who hopefully will come up here in a second. Um, and she took me under her wing as I was her first graduate student. She had just started the university and she had a project on UV treatment of wastewater. And Jeannie got me involved in that. I worked on that for a few years, published my first few papers with her and George as well. 
and I got I was awarded a Trojan Technologies UV Fellow for um, oh, there we go. Um, sorry, get ahead of myself. Trojan Technology UV Fellow as a grad student. So this is a UV company, one of the biggest ones, and we worked on UV wastewater disinfection. So that worked out pretty well, um, got me some funding. And then when I was ready to graduate, I met two folks in 1997, Jim Malley and Phil Singer. Jim Malley was kind of the lone wolf out there working on UV for drinking water. A few people working on wastewater, but he was working on drinking water and no one else was really working on this. So I met him at a conference, actually same conference I met Jim and Phil. And it turned out Phil was my academic great grandfather, which was, I didn't, didn't know that at the time. He kind of pulled me aside, hey, do you know we're related? That means like my, my advisor's advisor, advisor was Phil Finger. And Phil was a professor at UNC Chapel Hill, and he really took me under his wing as well and showed me the ropes for how to write proposals and got me involved in a few things and really mentored me throughout my career. He sadly passed away a few years ago. And Jim this is someone who I just, you know, could talk to about crazy ideas we had. And he was the only one who would listen to me at the time as I thought about my work at UV. In 1998, uh, I met Jen Clancy, and she had just discovered that UV was really effective against crypto spreading, which I'll tell you about in a second for disinfection. That was a really pivotal moment. And I also met Alex Mafidi. And Alex is actually an engineer working in Seattle here in Confluence Engineering. And he was the first person I met online and didn't know, never met in person. He wrote a proposal together, my first proposal. He worked at Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. He was my first online relationship academically. Um, but now that's, we do it all the time. I, I work with people I never met before now. It's kind of crazy. But Alex was the first one that I worked together. And we wrote a proposal together. And I got my first funding um, from the American Water Works Association Research Foundation. Uh, my first project as a, as a professor. So I mentioned 1998, kind of a tipping point for UV treatment because this discovery was made about cryptosporidium. And cryptosporidium is a pathogen that was implicated in an outbreak in Milwaukee in 1993 that sickened about 400,000 people in the city, almost the whole city, and it killed about 100 people this outbreak of cryptosporidiosis. And it's a, cryptosporidium is a protozoan pathogen. If you ever got Giardia hiking, it's a similar type of pathogen. <clears throat> and this really made the EPA very nervous because there's a lot of water utilities out there that don't filter their water. And filtration is the only way to remove cryptosporidium because chlorine is completely ineffective against it. In fact, when we use cryptosporidium in the lab, we store it in chlorine so we don't grow bacteria and it doesn't kill it. Chlorine is a typical disinfectant that we use in drinking water and wastewater. But cryptosporidium makes it through chlorine, but ideally it gets removed by filtration, but we had a big storm in, in Milwaukee, overtook the filtration system, and a lot of water got out that wasn't well filtered. People got sick and the EPA had to do something. Now, unfiltered utilities, there's water utilities around the country that don't filter their water. It's amazing to think that, but some of the biggest ones, in fact, Seattle, one of them, uh, Tacoma, uh, Vancouver, New York City, some of the biggest cities around North America don't filter their water but treat it very well and have actually amazing watersheds that protect the water. And we get almost pure water from the watershed. So we don't have to worry about filtration. And the EPA allows them to avoid filtration if they have enough other treatment uh, processes in place. So in 1997, it was, it was discovered that UV was very effective for killing cryptosporidium. It wasn't known before. And this really allowed the EPA to think about regulating cryptosporidium. And they eventually put in a new regulation in the mid 2000s that required disinfection for unfiltered utilities and UV was the best available technology at the time because it was the cheapest way to kill cryptosporidium and the easiest way to kill it with drinking water. And this paper was by Jen Clancy in 1998 or so um, that showed the UV was really effective. Um, and that was around the same time I started my faculty position. And I happened to be a UV expert from my grad student days, working on wastewater, trying to pivot to drinking water. And this had just happened as I was starting my, my career. So it was really kind of serendipitous. If you think about using UV to protect public health, um, what kind of things do we need to consider when we're thinking about public health protection? We definitely have a lot of concerns these days about pollutants, about pathogens in the air and the water. And we wanna make sure we're able to inactivate pathogens as one of the primary activities or primary goals of putting in a treatment process. We wanna protect the public from diseases. That's pretty much a no brainer. That's obviously what we do as engineers, environmental engineers. We also wanna be able to protect the public from <coughs> chemical contaminants. So organic and inorganic contaminants, whether it's uh, pharmaceutical contaminants, endocrine disrupting contaminants, uh, could be arsenic or chromium in the water. We wanna make sure we also don't form anything new that's gonna be hazardous as treatment engineers. 
And then we also want to make sure people will want to drink the water. If no one's going to drink the water, no one's going to breathe the air, going to have all these personal purifiers around, then we kind of didn't do our job. You know, we have to serve the public. We want to make sure there's no weird taste and odor issues. These are all things we need to do. And if you can do all these things, you definitely have an appropriate and effective uh, treatment solution that can help secure uh, public health. <clears throat> so I often muse about what an ideal treatment system might look like, because there's a lot of ways we can treat water. A lot of things we can add to water, a lot of ways we can treat it with different processes. But what's really ideal, if you could think high in the sky, what would you want to have as a treatment process? For me, I want to have a process that didn't use any synthetic or harmful chemicals. I would want it to be free of any byproducts or off gases, I want it to be free of unwanted residuals. You don't want to produce other pollutants while you're, while you're treating the water. You want to use sustainable materials. You want to make sure it has very little energy consumption, more sustainable, really fast acting, very easy to operate. It could be autonomous, used anywhere. These are kind of ideals. And when we think about UV, it has a lot of these attributes. And that's one of the things that draws me to study about UV treatment is that I really feel like it's an advance and kind of a, a forward way of thinking about treating water. Um, and it's amazing how it does it. I want to share, share that all with you. But it's challenging to get a new technology accepted, especially in the 21st century here. We have a lot of things we, we require. It's not like, you know, we have back in the day when chlorination was accepted, you know, we had cholera everywhere. We had, you know, diseases, not much infrastructure. Chlorine came in, it did the job but we didn't really question it. We didn't have a lot of tools to question it. But nowadays we have, we know we have to validate these technologies. We have to have safety factors on them. We need sensors and automations. We have to certify their, their performance. We have to model their performance. And that all takes basic research, which is what fuels the work that, that we do. We wanna make sure we minimize things like byproducts and residuals, <clears throat> the side effects and toxic materials. If we do that, we require the good things and kind of avoid the bad things. That's what we need these days to get something accepted. So I want to give you a little, take you on a bit of a journey of my work, um, talking about UV treatment. And first I want to talk about wavelengths of light. So light that's all around us, you know, it's amazing we can harness this energy and this power for a treatment process. Then talk about how we can tailor applications of UV using innovative new sources, such as LEDs and eczema sources. Now I'll take a little bit of an interlude to see where we're at kind of in the journey of UV and academia and, um, and engineering, <clears throat> and then talk about how we can leverage opportunities given what we know, what the potentials are for the future and what the future might look like um, in a world where we have a lot more application of UV technology. So first let's talk about the importance of wavelength. And a little bit of this is you know, a bit sciencey, a bit fundamental, but I wanted to share with you some of the things we've learned and we've discovered and just give you a basic understanding about, about light. <clears throat> so we all know that when we get exposed to light, say sunlight, we feel maybe a little bit warmer, maybe we get a suntan. That's because the photons of light that come down have energy, in them. They're, they're packets of energy, I think about them. And the lower the wavelength, the higher the energy of that photon. So with UV, we're talking about wavelengths that are beyond the violet of the, of the visible spectra. So here's, the spectra of kind of the rainbow, the visible light goes from about 400 to 700 nanometers. But below 400, we have a, the UV range. The UV range is broken up into about four different categories. One is UVA, which is sunlight coming down through our surface between wavelengths of about 315 to 400 nanometers. This is kind of what I think of as the UV tanning range. Then we have the UVB range, which is from about 280 to 315. Now the sunlight, when it hits the Earth's surface, it cuts off about 300, at about 300 nanometers. So 300 nanometers and below it doesn't reach the Earth's surface, thankfully, because we have an ozone layer. So, but wavelengths above 300 nanometers does reach the Earth's surface. So UVB contains some of these wavelengths, and that's what I think of as the sun burning range. It's higher energy photons. It can damage your skin more. It can penetrate into your skin and cause damage. And then there's the UVC range, which thankfully those photons don't actually make it to the Earth's surface in the sun because of the ozone layer. But these are the ones that are the germicidal and effective wavelengths that we want to use for water treatment. And over here, we can see a, a curve here that shows basically the absorption of nucleic acids or the effectiveness of UV for killing pathogens. <clears throat> and this effectiveness seems to peak around 254, 260 nanometers. These are going to be the really important wavelengths that we want to use for treatment of water and treatment of air because this, these are very lethal toward pathogens. And I'll talk to you about that a little bit more. So UV, this high packets of energy come in and they hit an organism and that light photon gets absorbed and that energy gets transferred to where it's absorbed, which is in the nucleic acids, highly absorptive. 
And that photon comes in and basically breaks apart the complementary bases on a double helix, in this case, the DNA, and fo forms damaged sites all along the nucleic acid that's, a, that's in your cell, in the cellular DNA, and in, in the microorganism DNA or RNA. And that basically causes organisms to not be able to replicate itself because it can't replicate its nucleic acids. It can't make another copy of itself. So it's basically inactivated or it dies off very quickly. And so UV works against anything that has nucleic acids, which is all of life. And if you can get the UV light into the pathogen, you can damage that nucleic acid, destroy its ability to replicate and inactivate that pathogen. And that's how UV works. It doesn't actually blast apart the organism, it actually just the photons get absorbed by the bonds and those bonds break apart. So it's good against bacteria, viruses, protozoa, any type of pathogen. It can also harm our skin. So that's another thing we wanna make sure we don't get exposed to it. Um, but UV is very effective for killing pathogens. So which wavelengths are we talking about? Typically, the wavelength that we talk about most often is 254 nanometers. That's because that's characteristic wavelength that's emitted by a low pressure mercury vapor lamp. The mercury lamps are all around. In fact, all these fluorescent lamps are mercury lamps and all these lamps actually emit UV light but that light actually gets captured by the phosphor coating on the lamp, and then it fluoresces in the visible wavelength range. That's why it's called fluorescent lights. But inside there's actually UV photons at high energy being generated and then emitting photons at lower energy in the visible range. So low pressure UV is very common. It was discovered in the early 1900s. Um, I think Peter Cooper Hewitt discovered that. And then we also have other lamps that if you increase the vapor pressure inside the lamp, and you have medium level of pressure relative to the low pressure, you get this different spectra. You get this emission of polychromatic light. And these are span wavelengths from you know, 200 nanometers all the way up into the visible range. But important for us is this 200, 300 nanometer range, which is where most of the activity takes place for disinfection and oxidation. So keep this, these figures in mind. The low pressure is a single wavelength, medium pressure is this polychromatic light. So what do the UV systems look like? Here's a UV system in the top left. That's used for wastewater disinfection. It's treatment for wastewater coming out of a wastewater treatment plant. You can see the lights kind of glowing. The green glow is kind of from little bits of algae in the water. Um, and the lamps are actually submerged in the water, which is kind of mind blowing to a lot of people. You don't usually want to combine electricity and water, but in the case of UV, if you do it, do it right way, it works fine. And you can control the lamps, uh, seal them off and run them off of electricity and have the UV energy being emitted. These are other UV systems. This is a, an advanced oxidation system. There's about 72 lamps in here going into the, into the screen here in each of these reactors. This gives a high dose for destroying contaminants in water. Uh, this is a medium pressure UV system. The lamps are basically underneath the water here and the water's running through again in kind of open channel flow. And this is a closed pipe system with about five medium pressure lamps in it. And this, this system here could treat about 20 million gallons per day. Think about UV light, it's traveling at the speed of light. You know, that's pretty fast, uh, three times 10 to the eight meters per second. And UV will act very, very quickly to inactivate pathogens. One of the things that's different about UV compared to chlorine, you might take about 30 to 60 minutes for chlorination to work for disinfection. For UV light, we're talking about one to two seconds often, as far as the time you need for inactivating the pathogens in the water treatment process. These systems are in, this is actually one of the first major systems put in in Tianjin, China that I visited. Um, brand new system. And these systems are in place in water reuse uh, facilities all around the world. And this is a common one that's used in wastewater treatment. <clears throat> so when you think about UV, you have to talk about the dose of energy because the UV photons have energy. We're delivering the energy to a system. So we've talked about UV dose. And this plot shows a bunch of different pathogens. This is for disinfection of pathogens. And the dose that's required in millijoules per centimeter squared, basically in energy over an area, so how much, you know, how, how intense the photons are within a given area. Um, and these, all these data show the dose required for four log reduction, which means that about 99.99% reduction in, in pathogens. So if you start with say 10,000 organisms, you're gonna get down to one organism left over. And that ten, you know, if you can get four log reduction, that's typically what regulators require for virus disinfection or bacteria disinfection in water treatment and also in air. So if we think about these, you can see these common bacteria like Legionella, Salmonella, cholera. These all take very, very low doses for inactivation. Then we have some viruses like polio virus and hepatitis. These take kind of moderate doses around 20 to 30 millijoules. And Cryptosporidium and Giardia take about 20 millijoules. 
And you see this line here on 40, it's this, this is basically the standard dose that's given in drinking water treatment plants. So it's required by most regulators is around 40 millijoules per centimeter squared. Um, but there's one organism, adenovirus, that really stuck out in this, in this dose response data. And it requires about four to five times more UV energy to kill this virus than it does to kill these other viruses or even these bacteria. And this really was a question that we asked, like why, what about this organism caused it to be so resistant? So it's five times more resistant say, than other viruses. So we, we did some work, uh, just exploratory work, and we looked at the polychromatic legs. This, all this work is done to 254 nanometers, which is the standard wavelength. And we looked at what happens if you expose it to this broad-based wavelength of medium pressure lamps. And what we found is when you have medium pressure UV, it actually reduced the dose that's required by quite a bit almost to the level of normal viruses. And we saw with this polychromatic light that we're able to you know, reduce the required dose to get the four log reduction. And if you remember, we have this polychromatic light here with this medium pressure UV that has these wavelengths. So then we asked the question, well, what, which wavelengths are, why is this happening? Which wavelengths are most important? And we got some funding to work with the National Institute of Standards and Technology to study individual wavelengths and looking at virus inactivation. And we did that over a period of time and we used one of their UV lasers, which they can actually get really narrow bandwidth of specific wavelengths generated. And we looked at exposing this virus, this adenovirus specifically to wavelengths at 210 nanometers, 220, 230, 240, 250, 254. And we want to see like what was the response of this organism and which wavelengths are most important for killing it. And maybe we can redesign our system to be more efficient for killing viruses. And what we found was that compared to 254 nanometers, this is wavelengths from 200 to 300, um, the, the effectiveness of 254, if we set it to one, the wavelengths down at 220 were about 12 times more effective for killing this virus than the 254 nanometer. And that explained why this polychromatic spectra is much more effective because it had those wavelengths being emitted. And this combined, all these wavelengths combined acted to better inactivate this virus, which previously was thought to be very, very resistant to UV. If we use the right wavelengths, we can then enhance the inactivation. And even wavelengths, say around 270, were about one and a half times more effective than, than at 254. So this really opened up a whole world of thinking about can we tailor wavelengths and pick wavelengths for achieving certain water quality goals or air quality goals. So we looked at this a little bit further, and we, we had about 10, 12 years of research on this specific topic, which we're still working on actually. Um, and we, we applied it a lot to viruses. In this case, this, this picture with the virus in the middle here is an adenovirus. Now, viruses are really interesting organisms. I took, got a chance to take a virology class when I was an undergrad. Viruses aren't even alive. We, we can't even call them microorganisms. They're just, we call them particles. They're viral particles because they don't have any, you know, they don't respire. They don't act like they're alive at all. All they are is packets of nucleic acids surrounded by proteins, basically. And adenovirus here has a bunch of interesting features. And Everyone knows about the spike proteins on the coronavirus and all that stuff, but you hear about that. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. The adenovirus here is basically a nucleic acid surrounded by these proteins. These are penton proteins, hexon proteins, and they have these fiber proteins. And the way that viruses work is these proteins out here are actually the, the messengers that go out and try to find the host to infect the host. So these proteins are really essential. So proteins can go and find a host, like say, find your intestine, and make you sick or find your lung cell, they could attach and then cause, start to cause an infection. They actually enter the cells and inject their nucleic acids in there and then they replicate themselves basically using the, um, the host as its source of, of new viruses. So that's how it causes an infection. So these viruses, proteins are really, really important for the infection cycle. But if you look at the wavelengths here, this graph shows the absorbance of DNA, nucleic acids, and the absorbance of protein across 220 to 300 nanometers here. And for the genomic damage, we're really concerned about and thinking about the most important wavelengths are gonna be in the range of the highest absorbance. So we see the highest absorbance between 240 and 280 for DNA and also below 220. And for viruses and their proteins, the most important wavelengths tend to be more around 280, where this peak is, and then below 240 nanometers where this whole range of absorbance is. So when we think about this, we can think about how can we kind of utilize this information to design new systems to actually take advantage of protein damage and DNA damage and better kill, if you want to call it that way, viruses and other pathogens.
The next part is to talk about how do we tailor these wavelengths to take advantage of these properties of UV light. And some of them have to do with advances in the technology, which have come about you know, in the time that I've been working on UV, some of it around UV LEDs and other lamps. So if we could think about designing our own UV system, our own emission profile, what would that look like? And we wanna include wavelengths that make sure they're really effective against pathogens. We want to not emit wavelengths that don't do anything for us because that's wasting energy. We don't want to waste electricity. We could ideally operate them and select them for specific micro, or microorganisms for disinfecting them. We could also take advantage of other things like oxidizing and, and photolyzing contaminants um, and cleaning up other types of contaminants as well other than microorganisms. So we tried to think about this and how would we put together um, wavelengths from individual sources to kind of tailor our own system. So one of the ways we thought about this is using UV LEDs. And LEDs you can, uh, are, are made to generate different wavelengths of light. Here we have a study where we did wavelengths at 280 nanometers, an LED that emitted at about peak to 280 and an LED that peaked at 260. Our thought here was that 260 will affect the DNA and the RNA and 280 will affect the proteins. And if we could just have a system that looked like this, that would be great. So we tried that out and we, and we studied that as well. And then we also looked at what can we think about, can we generate these lower wavelengths of any, of any light sources? Unfortunately, LEDs don't, aren't yet um, technologically advanced to admit at 220 yet, but there are other sources like eczema sources. So we looked at a few sources and here's the wavelength output of specific LEDs that are available commercially that LED technology is kind of caught up to. Um, you can get LEDs that emit at 255 nanometers, 265, and these are all within the, you know, that sweet spot of, of nucleic acid absorbance. And then 285 is in that spot of protein absorbance. And then 222 is really a really strong protein absorbance. And that's where we saw the really effective inactivation of that virus, the adenovirus I showed you earlier. So we did some work on this and we tailored wavelengths, putting them together and seeing what kind of results we saw. What we found was, the 280 and 260 combined, you know, they didn't exhibit any synergy, but they worked as expected. They both worked well, they worked well together, but we didn't see any really other than additive um, <coughs> effects. We didn't see much, much more. With the 222 though, that was the most effective for viruses. We did a number of different viruses here. And this plot here shows the 222 is the most, the steepest in activation rates. This is the, the log reduction uh, and the UV doses here. So the, the highest value is the best. So that 222 worked really well. And we found that when we, we sequenced the 222 with the low pressure 254 or the LEDs, that also worked very well and actually enhanced an activation. So there's a lot, a lot of work to be done on this and seeing which ways we can best combine different wavelengths to cause the best outcome for an activation. So a quick interlude. Um, UV uh, technology, as I mentioned before, is very nascent when I started out. I was a grad student um, working on this project with a few other students. Um, and, you know, what I did a, a year or so ago, I, I want to see like, you know, how have the number of publications and number of citations to UV research kind of changed over the years? And what I found was when I did a study on the web of science, I searched for UV and water treatment and disinfection. And what you find is if you look back from 1991, and then we go up to 2021, 2022, you see the number of publications kind of the number, the number of publications going up almost exponentially, and the number of citations to the publications also going up exponentially. This is really interesting because for me, when I started out and I published my first paper in 1993, there were only nine publications in that year that, that kind of fit this criteria, and only 13 citations to those publications. And if you look at the numbers now, in 2021, we had 290 publications. And over 15,000 citations in that single year. So getting in on the ground level doing research, and this is really kind of the right place at the right time for me. And it's really like an early investment in some stock that kind of went, went, went crazy. Um, and that's how I feel about being lucky to have the experience of working in UV technology and helping to push this along and helping to increase this, this, um, this exposure to UV technology and, and publications. And I bet if you looked at many technologies, you see that too, because there's so many publications out there, but this really is interesting. To, to take a look at this kind of analysis. So thinking about UV, what else can it do for me? What else can we do with UV? It does great for disinfection, which really makes a lot of sense, but it also can do a lot for destroying contaminants. 
We have a lot of concerns about endocrine disruptors, pharmaceuticals in our water, you know, things like um, organic matter, nitrosamines, <clears throat> and considering the reuse of water, which we have to do now due to the scarcity of water resources all over the world, what do you think about reuse? And UV can be used really effectively and it's almost used in almost every water reuse scenario. And that's because we can add, say, a, a promoter for radicals such as hydrogen peroxide and have exposure to UV light and form what we call hydroxyl radicals, these OH radicals. So if we add some hydrogen peroxide and expose the water to UV, we can form these radicals. We could also do it with, with chlorine or nitrate, but these reactions basically form hydroxyl radicals that lead to contaminant degradation. And this is a really important process that we've leveraged and we've done a lot of work in AOPs to look at contaminant degradation, really supporting water reuse and water reclamation. And because there's a lot of water stress, a lot of impaired water sources all around the world that we wanna be able to use and utilize safely. And to do that, we have to have advanced treatment technologies. So in this case, UV technologies here, it's UV hydrogen peroxide, usually fits into a water reuse system after membrane processes such as microfiltration or reverse osmosis. This is kind of the, the standard full advanced treatment, we call it fat treatment because it's kind of expensive and it's overkill, but this is what almost all the regular regulators wanna see when they put in a system to reuse wastewater because they're reusing an impaired water source that has viruses, has pathogens, has um, chemicals in it. I wanna make sure they're removing all that. And that really supports what we call potable reuse. This is the guide, guidelines from the WHO and this is the textbook on water reuse that I use in my classes, especially in areas of California with this huge water stress in Southern California. All these dots on this map are water reclamation projects or facilities that are in place or being built uh, in California because of such water stress. And the most famous one is Orange County Water District, Water Factory 21, which has been in place for a number of decades already. But there's new ones coming online all the time. In San Diego, there's a brand new project that's gonna be full potable reuse from wastewater resources using technologies like membranes and UV advanced oxidation. So there's a lot of excitement around that. So what else can UV do for us? It can't stop the next pandemic. <clears throat> so we all know about coronaviruses, obviously, um, because of this pandemic that we're currently still in. And this is a picture of the virus. We can see this virus again, viruses are really simple. They're just packets of nucleic acids surrounded by proteins. And at, uh, coronaviruses are no different. They have these spike proteins on them, which we hear about because we develop vaccines around those. But these spike proteins are really important for attaching to the host cell and causing the infections. So if we know that viruses are susceptible to UV. We know that this coronavirus has caused many types of pandemics, including not just the current one, but it's caused the original SARS pandemic, the MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, um, and it's a, it's a cause of the common cold as well. We know that conventional UV devices will work for virus exposure, for virus inactivation, <clears throat> but we also know that we have new technologies and new sources, and how, do those, how are those gonna work? How effective will they be? I wanna talk specifically about the UV device called BAR-UVC, which is this krypton chloride lamp that emits at that 222 wavelength, which is so effective against adenoviruses and see how it works for our coronaviruses. So first let's revisit the nomenclature a bit because I introduced this term called bar UVC and where it fits in. So again, the UV ranges of UVA, B and C and the germicidal range is really between say 200 to 300, 320 nanometers in this range. And we recently defined this term bar UVC to, to kind of encompass the wavelengths between 200 and 230 nanometers. And we define this because this is the area of UV light actually has minimal, causes minimal damage to humans. And we can be exposed to this in real time while we're having an activation and disinfection you know, in our midst as well. It's potentially a game changing technology. We've been really interested in looking at this um, as a technology to help improve public health in, in public spaces. So obviously we've all seen this sign you know, if you come across anything that has UV light in it, we want to make sure we don't look at the light, that we don't expose ourselves to it. And this is kind of my paradigm as well. I thought any UV light is going to be bad. You don't want to have exposure. You don't want to expose your skin. You don't want to look at it. It's going to be very dangerous. You know, it turns out that's not, not necessarily the case all the time. And I learned this over the last two or three years, and I've been looking at this far UVC light, and especially given the, the coronavirus pandemic. This is a figure that I got from a, a well-known um, Professor David Sliney from Johns Hopkins. Uh, he does a lot, of, a lot of work in ophthalmology. He basically taught me that, you know, we have these different wavelengths of light, say 200 nanometers up to 400 nanometers. This is, you know, the UV 
A, B, and C range that we talked about before. And this is typical skin, the stratum cornea, this kind of dead layer of skin on top, a couple of microns deep, and we epidermis and dermis. It turns out that not all UV light is created equally as far as how well it penetrates into your skin. And the, the depth that it can penetrate into the basal germative layers will dictate how dangerous it's gonna to be to you and your health. Some of the, we know that some light can cause skin cancer, melanoma. That's mainly wavelengths in the sunlight range you know, up in the 315 to, to 400 nanometers because they penetrate deeply into your skin layer. The 254 can get into your epidermis, but not very deep. It can definitely cause burns, but it won't cause melanoma, which is, you know, something that people don't really understand. And 222, it's so powerful and so energetic, it gets absorbed in the first few microns of your skin layer, and it doesn't go any deeper. And that skin layer is constantly being sloughed off. And for instance, so you, even if it's damaged a bit, it will just regenerate and your skin won't feel the damage over the long term at all. So this is really interesting because this offers the opportunity that these wavelengths can be used in public where people are. So again, we have the light coming into the skin and it's a similar thing is true for exposure to your eyes because your eyes have the tear duct layer, basically 222 can't go past and can't get into your cornea. 254 can get a little bit into your, your, your um, the tops of your eyes, but it's just gonna cause you discomfort and it'll cause you a little bit of a burning sensation, but you'll be better after a while. 222, you won't feel anything, you know, up to a certain dose. So 254 even, you know, it's, you shouldn't try to get exposed to it, but it's not gonna give you cancer. Um, 222, on the other hand, you basically won't feel a thing when you're around it and when you're exposed to it. So this offers a lot of interesting opportunities for uh, real-time public health. So there's an organization called uh, ACGIH, it's the American Conference on Governmental Industrial Hygienists, and they set rules for the exposure to ex external hazards. One of them is light. And they, they recently revised the guidelines for exposure to UV. And this graph shows that 200 nanometers up to 400 nanometers UV. And what this graph here shows is basically how long, what, how much of a dose you're allowed to get over eight hours at different wavelengths. So for instance here, you're only allowed to get a very low dose of UV at around 270 nanometers, which is probably the worst wavelength because that's going to cause the most damage to your skin as far as uh, burning it and getting deep in and causing potentially causing some problems. And if you go lower in wavelengths, the allowable dose gets higher, so you're less dangerous, so you're allowed more exposure over time. And if you go higher, you're allowed more as well. But when you look at 222 specifically, they just recently revised the guidelines. So the old guidelines are down here in black and the new guidelines for skin are in green and then for eyes are in red. And it turns out that the doses that you're allowed to be exposed to now are fairly high. <clears throat> Remember we talked about that 40 millijoules as the disinfection for water. Um, the doses you're allowed to be exposed to for uh, skin and eyes now, for skin up to 479 millijoules, so 10 times higher than the typical dose used in water. And for eyes, you're allowed to be exposed to about 161 over an eight hour period. So this is a cumulative dose over there. It's like getting radiation exposure. So they allowed, they set these, these standards. It used to be 23 for everything, but because of work by David Sliney and others, they've convinced these hygienists to up the values to get, allow higher levels of exposure because it's relatively safe for human exposure. And these lamps look like this. These are far UVC lamps, krypton chloride lamps. This one's from Yushio, which is a company out of Japan. Eden Park's a company out of, in the Chicago area. They both produce different types of lamps, but we use both of these lamps in our lab. And these lamps emit really clean emission lines at 222 nanometers. This is 200 to 280 here. Well, if they're unfiltered, they also have a bit of a bump at 258, which you don't want to have because that's worse for you. So you want to minimize that. So they filter these lamps out. And if you look at that on a log scale, you can see the, real, the difference between the filtered and the unfiltered. The filtered lamps emit very low, 258 and the unfiltered ones a bit higher. You really want to isolate this wavelength. You know this is going to be very effective and very safe. So again, let's go back to this idea of virus disinfection. Again, we have 254 and we have this 220 being more than 10 times effective for inactivation. And that's really where this idea of using far UVC for virus inactivation could be really, really powerful. And if we look at the different wavelengths we have, available, we have this 222 available, which we're gonna use, it's 254. And again, overlaying this with the DNA absorbance, 
and then the protein absorbance. And you see the protein absorbance at 280 and very high absorbance down at 222. So we really think that the damage to the viral proteins by this wavelength here is really what's affecting disinfection and causing high levels of inactivation of these viruses. We were fortunate to work with some scientists and researchers and microbiologists at the University of Arizona. We actually did some studies on SARS-CoV-2 and Omicron variants as well. We had disinfection of those viruses. And th these are the data we have. We also studied the human coronavirus 229E, which causes colds and influenza virus. And this is the dose response we call of these viruses to UV. And this is doses from zero, two, four, six, and eight millijoules, very, very, very low doses. And this is, you know, different log reduction, one, two, three log reduction. We can get three log reduction of all coronaviruses at a dose of four millijoules with this 222, which is extremely low. And if you think about, if it just takes four millijoules, but you're allowed to get exposed to 480 millijoules over the whole day, this could be a really powerful tool for protecting public health. So we're really excited about using this wavelength and thinking about these doses because less than five millijoules, you know, will give you over 99.9% reduction. So, you know, all these coronaviruses require very low doses of UVC, and they're almost the most sensitive pathogen we know to UV light. So we'll come back to this at the very end. But first, I want to just tell you a bit about the future, what I think, what I like to envision. Because we've talked about a lot of different things, different UV wavelengths, different lamps, LEDs, water, air, uh, oxidation. So what else can we think about? What is it, what's the outlook look like for the future? One of the areas I'm really excited about is small systems. Uh, like remote communities, small communities. We did a study up in Jamestown, Colorado. It's about 300 people up in the mountains outside of Boulder. And we studied this community and put in a UV system. And we thought UV LEDs would be really nice to use because they have a really small footprint. They're, you can turn them on and off, cycle them immediately. They just start up immediately. You can operate them autonomously. They have a very long life. There's no mercury in them. They're, very, they're solid state materials. It can disinfect really quickly. You know, it has very low power requirements. So we studied this system and we used one of these LED sources from Aquasense. And this is the output of about 282 nanometers, which is good for the proteins, good for the, good for the DNA damage. Um, and this is what the system looked like. And we studied this for over a year. What we found was that over a full year in this mountain community with freezing cold temperatures, a lot of turbidity, a lot of runoff in the spring, um, we ran it, we didn't touch it once. All we did was went up and take samples and operated the whole year under adverse conditions. And it cost less than $250 to run the whole time treating this water. And the disinfection performance we did it side by side with chlorination, it performed exactly the same and even better in some cases than the chlorine disinfection. So we kind of wanted to prove over a long period of time that these LED systems could work for communities. Again, this is, these are communities that have no full-time operators. They're just, you know, the mayor might go out and check the system once in a while. Uh, but that's a really exciting advance in LED technology. You could potentially use these in remote communities and rural areas uh, for enhancing disinfection. Then we thought about what else could UV do? We know UV works really well in the treatment plant here, but what about putting it out into the distribution system? Can we use LED technology to distribute UV throughout the whole distribution system? Can it disinfect water in the mains? Can it disinfect water in storage tanks? Can I use it at the point of entry into homes? Can I use it on your faucets? Can you even put it in pipelines that go into homes and into communities and maybe get rid of chlorination altogether? We think about the problems we have in the US with infrastructure. You know, we're huge, a hugely aging infrastructure. We have a lot of problems. And most people get their water with chlorine in it because that's required. The EPA requires it. It's a law in the US. Um, and we do it mostly because we have pipes that look like this in some cases. And we want to protect the water as it goes through the whole pipe network. But there's many countries in the world that don't use any chlorine residual in their drinking water. They don't use chlorine at all. They distribute the water, no problem. People drink it, they don't get sick. In the US though, we're 15 times or 18 times more likely to have violations of coliform, which is the organism that we're monitoring for, than a place like the Netherlands, where the Netherlands doesn't even use any chlorine. So something doesn't match here. Something's not working. Something's not right with our system, with our distribution system. So we have to ask the question, can we do better? Can we think about ways to make our water system better in the distribution system itself as we deliver water to all the homes around the world? So imagine we can put in UV everywhere. Imagine UV, I mean, it's certainly a proven technology. 
I feel like the technology is there immediately to put in UV for point of use and point of entry into homes and, and, and on faucets itself, that technology is there. Uh, we think about UV also in systems that don't use any residual. So if you have a small groundwater system that serves less than say 25 uh, households, you don't need to use chlorine, but we should have some disinfectant in there. UV would be perfect for that kind of situation. And certainly thinking about as we rebuild our infrastructure, can we install smart systems, install LEDs, install other types of protection devices around that would be helpful for protecting public health? Can we even develop UV robots that will go through pipes and disinfect biofilms on pipes as uh, water is being distributed? This is all technology that's potential and possible now. Of course, we need to do a lot of work with regulators and stakeholders to think about not using chlorine, something we do all the time in the US. But in many parts of the world, chlorine taste and chlorine odor is not really what people want to, want to have. Um, we do a lot of work in developing communities and working with people who get their water from hand pumps and, and tap stands. And when you go to these communities and you want to add chlorine to water, oftentimes they don't want to see it. It's either culturally not accepted or they don't want to have taste and odor issues. They don't want to see chemicals in their water. So we need to make sure we're sustaining services, but also we're making sure we're protecting public health. And these types of systems where you might have a hand pump here or a tap stand, we're working on ways to integrate UV technology into these pumps itself. So as the water's coming up, it just takes a second or two to disinfect. And when we come out with clean water there, because we find about 30 to 40% of the work, water systems we work on are contaminated with E. coli. So is there a way to embed UV here or embed UV in a tap stand that might be in a community? This is really exciting to think about that. And honestly, UV systems are already almost everywhere if you look around. Does anyone have a SteriPen they use for backpacking? Yep, I use it all the time. Um, here's a SteriPen. Um, this system is just for your household. Uh, if you, you're from Canada, you live in cottage country, you get your water from a lake. Everyone has UV systems like this to, to protect the water quality. You can disinfect your toothbrush even with UV light. These are all conventional sources with LEDs. There's these tiny sources you can put on your dishwasher, on your refrigerator water. This is that source we used, just a small system about this big, treated all the water in the Jamestown community. You can have UV in a cap of your water bottle, press the button, shake your water bottle around for 30 seconds, be disinfected. This is what an LED might look like. It's really tiny, it's a tiny chip. It's, it fits on the, on the tip of your finger. And think about UV robots. These are already in use in hospitals, in things like the subways in New York, in buses after, their, after hours to disinfect surfaces. They have UV systems that disinfect planes, work with Boeing to, to study surface disinfection. This is a UV 254 lamp. You see the protection the person has. Obviously, they don't want to get exposed and get their skin burned. Um, that's one, another application. There's UV wand if you want to disinfect that bedspread in the hotel you just got to. Um, there's also disinfection devices for your phone, UV light, even for your child's uh, pacifier, your binky. And there's many applications for UV. <clears throat> this morning, I had the chance to have breakfast with uh, Bruce here, who thank, thankfully came to my talk. We ate at the Five Points Dive Bar, if you've ever been there, in Queen Anne. That's a breakfast joint. Uh, they have upper room germicidal. So in the ceilings, they have UV lights that are facing upwards. And as the, water, as the air gets circulated through, they have a lot of fans going. Um, all that air gets disinfected in the upper regions. And these, lamp, these lights, are embedded there. So that's a really excellent way to help protect people um, and not expose anyone to UV at the same time. You can also have um, UV in the HVAC system. A lot of HVAC systems have UV embedded in them. So as the air passes through and the air handling system recycles the air through the, through the room, you'll get exposure to UV light. Just uh, two weeks ago, there was an op-ed in the New York Times. If you saw that, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out. It's we have the technology to stop super spreading without masks. This is a UV light and that's a coronavirus. This is put out by um, Don Milton and, and Ed Nardell. And some quotes from that. This is GUV, germicidal UV can easily and silently kill half the germs floating in indoor air every two minutes or less. It was developed and tested beginning in the 1930s and same technology as fluorescent lights, which I told you about. And it's still commonly used in tuberculosis wards. And they also go on to say that newer available UV sources, like the far UVC they're talking about, are even safer for skin, do not irritate the eyes. They can be used safely at lower areas of a room and can directly disinfect the air between people sitting at a dinner table. So you can think about your next conference room meeting or in a restaurant, you have a UV light sitting at the table. 
everyone's being protected. In fact, if you do the calculation, if you design a UV, far UVC system to make sure we never exceed the TLV of the, the threshold limit value for eight hours of eyes, say if we design it for eight hours exposure uh, for your eyes at 161, you can get 90% reduction of SARS-CoV-2 every six minutes of air circulation. And that will definitely help to reduce transmission and probably eliminate it. So I was part of my uh, work in the past couple of years was talking about this a lot. And I got asked to get on a podcast with Bill Nye, do science rules. And that was my 29 minutes of fame recently after that photo from 1991. Um, but great time to meet with one of my childhood heroes, uh, Bill Nye, and talk with him about UV. We've had a podcast, we recorded a podcast called Killing COVID-19 at Speed of UV Light, which is what I stole for this, this talk um, as well. And I also had the chance to think about how do I get my work out to the public more? You know, how do we get people to read it more? And one of the things that we academics have lately is this avenue to publish through what's called the conversation, which is a venue that takes academic research, helps you distill it down to something really understandable by the public. And I had the chance to write two articles in the conversation over the past couple of years. The first one was ultraviolet light can make indoor spaces safer during the pandemic if it's used the right way. And the editors there help you write in a language that's really accessible. So I had that, that, that publication came out, and it was a short, about a thousand words or so. And I, then I wrote a second one after our SARS work came out and it says the type of ultraviolet light most effective at killing coronavirus is also the safest to use around people. That was the title. And these are, are articles that, you know, it kind of takes a lot of time to write them, but they actually have more impact than most of the academic journals I write, most of the academic papers I write. This, these two pieces alone, have been picked up at news outlets around the world and they've had over a hundred thousand reads on them. And that's way more probably than all my papers combined by all the academics that have ever read them. So it's really important to get out and get your work out in the public like this. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I hope you learned a little bit about UV, about these different applications, about the future, and hopefully we can have a little conversation and take some questions.